let's start with this guy. Most of you know him probably, Charles Charles D. Uh, Charles had a theory which uh, which most of us are familiar with, uh, which is how how does evolution work? And in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, there were certain um, terms and concepts that were the engines of the evolutionary process. Among them, the most um, most familiar ones are uh, the, uh, the idea of competition and struggle and survival of the fittest. Um, this is well known. Um, what, what is also quite well known is the idea that Darwin's idea, ideas also had um, almost direct social implications. So they could be used to talk about um, economy and the competition uh, within the, uh, the um, capitalist system and the way that it brings out the, the best, so to speak, um, or also to talk about human societies and the importance of struggle in improving um, races. And the most famous idea for that, of course, is the case of Nazi Germany, where the idea of racial struggle as uh, a way to understand history and to also change history uh, was integral to the way that that many important Nazi thinkers and politicians saw the world. And I have uh, a couple of books here that I uh, show that that are uh, that this idea is central to them. So far, so good, or maybe not so good. Uh, what about Gregor Mendel? Mendel is the father of, of modern genetics. And uh, his studies that were um, published in 1866 were about this cross-pollination of peas. Most of us studied that in, in high school. Um, and um, for those who, uh, who don't remember their high school teaching, and for good reason, um, he cross-pollinated peas that differed in all kinds of traits. Uh, one of them, for example, was the pea color. Um, and then he saw that in the first generation of crosses, the peas were all yellow, even though their, their parents, one was yellow and the other was green. And in the next generation of crosses, the green reappeared again. And his idea was that some traits are recessive and some are dominant. And there are two copies for, for um, this is not exactly how he saw that, but this is how we now understand it. And there are two copies for for each gene that determine the trait. And if we understand that, we can understand the way that heredity works. So this is more or less what Mendel uh, discovered in the 1860s. He published his paper. Uh, not enough people thought that it was really interesting or important. But at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there was this rediscovery of Mendel's laws and uh, the same, more or less the same kind of of, of rules seem to apply to many other organisms, flowers, rabbits, guinea pigs, also to the human domain. So far, so good. It is the, the beginning of modern genetics, and any student of genetics also in the university uh, would start by learning these, these Mendelian laws. Um, but it seems uh, that this is not a social theory. This is a, a technical theory and also a valid one. Uh, which explains how heredity works. And unlike the case with Darwin, there's nothing special to say about it. So uh, this is scientific theory, but not a social theory. This is at least the image that, that we usually get. And this is where, where I come in. So my, my main argument is that we should look at Mendelism of the first half of the 20th century as a social theory. Social here in the sense of a theory that looks at society, that tries to um, explain how things are happening uh, within society, and that tries to offer solutions to, to problems that it finds within society. And in order to, I'm not going to go over my book right here, uh, um, but instead I would like to illustrate some of my arguments um, by first showing some, some things that, that I hope would convince you that indeed Mendelism at the time was a social theory. Um, and also by looking at one concept uh, of the many that, that is included in, in Mendelian theory and show how closely connected the social and the scientific concepts were. So let's start with, with a couple of illustrations. Um, I always like to use this image. This image was um, 
printed in the in 1934 in a Nazi journal, and uh, it showed the way that racial science is taught in high schools in Germany. Um, and what I like about this photo, which was already used by a couple of historians to talk about racism in Germany, is that naturally um, we look at these facial types with their skulls and and nose shapes and this. Um, these faces, um, and we identify them as, as the way that the Nazis thought about, about races, and that is correct. Everybody is looking at this chart, right? But if you look carefully enough, on the right, there is another chart hanging there on the board. And this is a chart showing basic Mendelian crosses of uh, red, white, and pink flowers of the kind that, that we, we saw before. And obviously, this chart was not hung there uh, by mere coincidence. So it was perceived to be both by the teacher and by the, the photographer who came to the classroom and by the editor of the newspaper, uh, perceived to be part and parcel of racial teaching. This is not the only example for, for the presence of, of Mendelian thinking within racial science. Here's another, another um, article from, from an illustrated paper. And if you look once again carefully enough, aside from the skull shapes, if you look at the um, bottom left and at the bottom right, you see that students are drawing the Mendelian laws and, and with their help learning dynamics related to racism. So this is in high school. But let's say that uh, the year is 1930 something and you're not in high school, you're already a um, uh, and by the way, these are this is the way that, that the, the notebooks of the of the um, children in high school look like. Uh, again, with all these Mendelian drawings, um, but the text uh, shows that they immediately implement these kind of Mendelian thinking, not only to talk about um, race in general in general, but to talk about why sterilization, for for example, is is so important and how we can use these laws to make sure that defects, that pathological defect, that all kinds of mental pathologies are not passed to the, to the next generation. So high school. Now let's say that you're beyond high school, uh, already a grad student. And uh, if you were a grad student in, uh, sorry, an undergrad student in, um, in a university in Germany in the 1930s, you might be asked to watch the following movie. The movie is eight minutes. I'm going to show you just one and a half from them. Um, so what we see here is um, two rabbits, a female and a male one. Both of them are externally healthy, but uh, both of them contain the recessive gene for, um, for a certain malady. Um, and therefore, when they pass their uh, genes to their uh, descendants, to their offspring, they have three externally healthy rabbits um, two of them are actually internally sick or diseased in a sense and one which is both internally and externally um, ill the illness that this movie looks at is something like the parkinson disease so they, they are trembling they have this kind of trembling limbs and, and limbs and, and body and uh, what the movie does is now shows us the result of this crossing of the these animals carrying the recessive genes um, and as, as you might be able to see, um, they are trembling quite horribly. Uh, these are, these are the, the good part of the movie. So it gets more, more uh, annoying and uh, distressing as the movie goes on. I spared you this, uh, this, these images. Um, and obviously, if you look at this in the context of Nazi Germany of the 1930s, the, what you would think about is, OK, we need to sterilize this. this uh, these poor rabbits in order not to pass these genes to their um, epileptic um, descendants or offspring. And notice that you don't need Darwin for that. You don't need long-term eugenic thinking. You do need mentalism in order to understand why sterilization is, is important. Um, okay, that we already saw. Uh, what if you were not a student at all, but a worker in a factory? Um, you might find yourself taken by your uh, boss, the, the, the head of the factory, in one of the days to nice cultural activity to watch a play that was 
going throughout Germany and was quite successful. Tens of thousands of, of uh, viewers saw it. Um, the play was called something like Hereditary Stream. And during the intermission, while the set was being rearranged for the next, the next act, you would see for two minutes a projection of the slide on the right, which shows the recessive inheritance of epilepsy and would again um, make sure that you understand why it is so important not to pass these uh, horrible genes to, to the descendants. Um, the play itself would also uh, talk about mentalism all the time, but you know, visuals are always uh, important to make sure that the message is, is, is passed. Um, if, God forbid, you were a Nazi um, bureaucrat in the 1935 discussing the fate of Jews uh, under the newly legislated Nuremberg laws in, in Germany in September to November 1935, uh, you might find yourself reading this memorandum, which was handed to the discussants in, in one of these, uh, these meetings by Arthur Goethe, who was a advisor on medical issues in the Minister, Minister of, Ministry of Interior. And as you can see, this memorandum tries to explain what to do with Jews, half-Jews, and, and quarter Jews by referring to Mendel's laws and their application to the human domain. These ideas found their, their way also into the actual Nuremberg laws uh, that defined uh, who was a Jew or half Jew, etc. in Nazi Germany. Note that the, the iconography, the visual language, uh, repeats this kind of, of medical, biological, Mendelian symbolism, um, which also went into the, the Daily Press later. This is a caricature showing uh, Jews before and after, or um, before the Nuremberg Laws, and now that the Nuremberg Laws were, were passed. So as you can see here, before the, this rich um, Jew was tempting all the girls, um, and now he's poor because the these um, black circles of Nure the Nuremberg laws circle him, and he has no no way to escape them. Um, okay. So these were just a couple of illustrations. Um, now I want to show two things. One is the relation between Mendelian ideas and, and concepts relating to racial purity. And then I want to talk about a specific racial, uh, sorry, a specific Mendelian concept. So racial purity. Purity was integral to Mendelism from the very beginning. Uh, one of the, the terms used to discuss Mendelian theory was, it, it was called the theory of the purity of the gametes. The gametes are the sex cells. And they were pure in the sense that they were not influenced not neither by external environment nor by each other. So if I have a gene for uh, whatever, it is not influenced by other genes that I have. Every gene, every allele actually remains pure and unaffected, or this was at least the way that it was understood. Um, but these ideas then found their way into ideas of so what it means, what did it mean to be individually pure, not the gametes themselves, but the organism. So individual purity was uh, defined as homozygosity. Homozygosity means that you have two identical copies for a certain gene. The one that you got from uh, your mother and the one that you got from your father are identical. Uh, this was understood uh, as individual purity, and this was later extended also to the entire population. So a racial purity or a population purity was uh, the state where the entire population was homozygous and had identical genes. Notice that purity becomes uniformity. This is not a trivial move to move from purity to uniformity of of one's genes of, or of the entire population of genes. And uh, this was the, a new way to understand what purity means. And here is a, a quote from Hans F. K. Günther, who was uh, perhaps the most influential racial writer of the period, who said, part of the definition of the term race is not only the phenotypic, that is the external similarity of a group of persons, but above all their genotypic matching not only the racial purity of appearance, but above all, homozygosity, 
a race is therefore a group of people equal in kind and equal in heredity. And he continues to say that only the racially pure person uh, was, was beautiful or nice, sure. His body and also his mental essence are uniform, and each part of his body and essence indicates the equal physical and mental hereditary factors. Um, now, uh, if we understand that, then we, we may need to re-understand what racial hygiene means. Uh, racial hygiene means to regain purity in the sense of genetic homozygosity. Now, literature on fascist uh, ideologies, uh, especially in the past um, decade or so, continues to uh, continually stresses the fact that the idea of the re rebirth of the nation um, and and the idea of homogeneity were very like at the core of fascist ideologies. And here we see these ideas being mentalized. Uh, so it's not only homogeneity, it's homozygosity. Okay, so the genes need to be need to be the same. And the project of, of regaining this purity of nordification is the project of collecting the genes that are scattered, the Nordic genes that are scattered in the German population recollecting them, recombining them, as so as to uh, uh, regain this state that is imagined to have existed a thousand years ago when the Nordic race existed pure and homozygous uh, uh, in certain parts of Europe. Here's a quote that would, again, help to, to understand what I'm talking about, um, taking form from another textbook. Uh, and says that the 50% Nordic blood in the German population make it improbable that any German person would be totally free from Nordic hereditary material. Even if a person carries many physical markers of one of the other European races, this does not yet testify to his mental and spiritual disposition. For in most, in most cases, we are dealing with hereditary dispositions that, according to hereditary laws, mendelize independently. In other words, this is a, another way of thinking about, about, uh, about the project of, of, of um, about the racial project. And this is a mentalized way of, of doing so, which was extremely popular in Germany at the time. There was one annoying obstacle to this project, and this obstacle was called recessive traits. So I want to talk a little about now uh, about recessive traits, a term which today to us sounds neutral and doesn't carry any special ideological overtones. Um, let's see how recessive traits are described in the scientific literature of the first two decades of the 20th century. So first of all, uh, Charles Davenport in the US uh, hypothesized that the more progressive states are dominant and the less developed features are recessive. Not everyone accepted this kind of of the position, but it was there. Um, what was accepted was that the vast majority of hereditary diseases are grounded on recessive pathological dispositions. Um, at the beginning, the idea was that probably the, the pathologies are dominant, but soon enough it changed. Uh, it has also some kind of evolutionary thought behind it, saying that yeah, the dominant traits have to be um, selected against. Um, and the result was that hereditary diseases and recessive traits were, were seen as, um, as parts of, of the same thing. Uh, mutations were a bad thing, and mutations were usually recessive. So uh, there was another association between being something pathological or deviant or deleterious and being recessive. And in the case of specific diseases, the rule applied that the most severe forms are inherited in a recessive manner, the lighter forms in a dominant one. So for example, if feeble-mindedness is controlled by genes, there could be two versions of feeble-mindedness. The more severe one would be the recessive and the less severe one would be the dominant. Uh, the guy on the uh, bottom here is Fritz Lenz. He's a German eugenicist, a very influential one. And he found himself in 1927 
explaining to his peers that he says, listen, when I, when I wrote that blondness is recessive, by no means did I want to imply that it is pathological in the sense. Um, I just meant that it is recessive and, uh, and the fact that he had to explain that also um, immediately shows us the associations that were common at the time. But it didn't end there. Recessive traits were much more difficult to control and, there, and therefore much more dangerous. So there was also an issue of, of control here. We cannot see them. Uh, they, are, they are inside the body. We don't know who has them. Um, they ruin breeders' attempts to produce new and constant and pure races. And finally, the Mendelism throws a clear light on the essence and the biological effect of consanguinity. The danger of consanguinity lies in the increased probability of the recombination of recessive dispositions, and most of the pathological traits are inherited in a recessive manner. So here we come full circle. Um, and this was a, a fine way of also explaining how come certain populations, uh, as, such as the Jews, who are known for their habits of consanguineous marriages, or at least inbreeding within the community, have all kinds of pathological traits. Now we can explain that it's because of their recessive dispositions. So mentioning the Jews, how was all this applied to uh, the Jews? Um, the Jewish type was usually considered as dominant, the darkened skin color or the, the protruding nose and other features uh, were understood usually as dominant traits. But in 1911, Radcliffe Salomon, um, a British geneticist, a student of William Bateson, made a study on Jewish physiognomy and argued that actually the, the Jewish face is inherited in a recessive manner and talked about this kind of lurking Jewish facial expression which, which lurks there. Um, and this, this, I really like this, uh, I don't like it, but it is useful for me, this use of, of the, the verb lurking because we can see how easily these concepts of Jewish, sorry, of recessive traits as hidden as something that you cannot see were easily um, associated with a host of anti-Semitic stereotypes relating to the fear of, of Jewish emancipation and the fact that we cannot see who is a Jew and who is not a Jew anymore because they are among us. And those of you who know the, the horrible film, uh, Yud Zeus, um, know that he tells of a Jew that masquerades as a non-Jew and therefore enters uh, a German city, uh, which eventually leads to the contamination of the entire city with, with horrible Jews. So, um, so the idea that Jewish traits are somewhere there beneath and you cannot see them uh, fit perfectly with with the fears from, uh, from the Jews and with, with the notions of what a recessive trait is. Um, and here we can see in this nice uh, Venn diagram that Jews and pathologies, consanguinity, bastardization, all of these are uh, concepts which are cultural and political and social ones. And recessive trait uh, it's, uh, conjoins all of them together in a certain way. Um, Quotes are again useful here. The Mischlinge, the, the half-breeds, deceive us, deceive us through their outward appearance. Next to the visible dispositions, they possess dispositions which are hidden from sight. One cannot see by the external features of the organism what hereditary dispositions are hidden in it. Is this a description of Mendelian genetics or of um, of uh, um, you know is it an anti-semitic description of of jews of course it's both uh, simultaneously there are jews that appear completely german they are children of mixed marriages the reason for their german appearance is that the traits of the aryan parent are dominant is this mischling therefore a german no the children that this mischling produces or his grandchildren display absolutely jewish racial features. Um, these discussions were not just in textbooks, they um, uh, can also be found in the highest echelons of the Nazi state, including Adolf Hitler and Himmler and Walter Gross and Martin Bormann. 
um, and I'm not going going to go into that uh, right now, but it uh, practically influenced the way that especially Jewish Mischlinge were treated in Nazi Germany and the discussions of what should be done with them. Um, finally, since I don't have much time for my presentation, I want to leave some time for the questions that you might have. Um, it is interesting to see how this kind of Mendelian thinking is applied differently to different spheres. For example, when dealing with uh, blondness, which was recessive, um, Nazi scholars and German scholars in German thought that because blondness is recessive, it means that there is much more Nordic blood in the population than one can see, right? Because the blonde that we see are only the homozygous ones, the ones who have two copies of, of these genes, but there are many, much more, that have just one copy of this blonde gene that was the Nordic gene, um, and we just cannot see it, but it's there. So that was encouraging for them. Um, whereas where it came to the Jews, the idea that some traits were excessive meant that they need to be exposed uh, in one way or another or eradicated so that they would not um, regain their homozygosity. Inbreeding, the idea of inbreeding and purity, um, peasants which are in faraway villages in these rural communities were thought of as the fountain of Nordic blood. They would help us regain our Nordic purity. So um, the fact that they, that they only marry among themselves is actually a good thing. It means that they are pure, racially pure, homozygous. And when it came to Jews, the same kind of, of um, inbreeding was what made the recessive traits, the pathological traits, reappear, and therefore it was genuine. So the same concept could be, of course, applied differently according to the uh, standards of the, the applier. So um, what I try to argue is that, as you, mm, I, I hope I at least started to convince you that Mendelian theory was embedded in and in constant um, um, contact with social terms and social thinking and, and the two were, um, were intermixed, uh, which leaves, of course, the question open of how come uh, we usually don't think about Mendelism as, as such a social, cultural, and even political theory. And uh, the answer is complicated, but it can begin with the fact that everything that I just spoke about is usually uh, thought of as eugenics, and or as racial hygiene and therefore is thrown into another basket and leaves Mendelian theory pure um, and uncontaminated by, by uh, social impact, which is very good for the geneticists, uh, but not very good for us as historians and as those who want to know how things really were. Um, moreover, eugenics, which is the an important term also puts everything back in the Darwin basket because eugenics was coined by Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, and um, and again it doesn't belong to to Mendel and these ideas. Whereas I try to argue that this is not just eugenics; there were all kinds of eugenicses, um, and I'm talking about a particular kind, uh, which was a Mendelian kind of eugenics, uh, and which also a Mendelian kind of cultural thinking and political thinking, uh, which eugenics, I'm not sure it captures all of it. So I'm right on time. Um, if you want to know a little more about that, uh, I recommend this book, which just came out uh, in Cambridge University Press and has lots of words in it. Um, and I hope you would find it um, insightful. And now I'm open to your remarks, questions, or anything else. Thanks very much, Amir. Um, I have uh, sent you a question that we've received. I, I just wondered if you can see that in your questions box. Hello. Hello. Yes. What drove me into, I'm, I'm reading the question, uh, by Gemma Irving. What drove you into this area of research? Why is this of interest to you? And in terms of current affairs, is this topic relevant today? Mm hmm. That's a very uh, um, loaded question, or at least the answer is loaded. Um, 
I think um, several things drove me into this into, into this topic. Um, when I did my bachelor's degree, uh, I did it in mathematics and history, um, and and I felt uh, already then the, this gap between between how science, uh, well, mathematics, I'm not sure, but how scientists think about what they do and how historians look at the same thing. And I was attracted to go in these uh, these zones that are between uh, where he into, to look into the history of science. Um, Especially Nazi Germany. Well, I'm I'm a, 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 what is called in Israel a third generation to Holocaust survivors. Um, I have um, um, my family history is such that uh, made me want to ex explore the history of Nazism. And finally, I'm also Israeli, uh, which means that I'm. Uh, preoccupied with questions of 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 good and bad, and who is good and who is bad, and um, issues of that of that kind. Um, so all of this together made me want to look at the work of racial scientists and try to see if they indeed were this group of lunatics that were doing just this pseudo weird stuff, or maybe they were more serious people that were convinced that they were actually doing good stuff. Um, this was again at the beginning of my of my academic career, in a sense. Uh, but uh, what this led me is to find all these these kind of Mendelian preoccupation with genetics uh, in the writings of psychiatrists and anthropologists and other scientists, and their genuine attempts to take the their ideology and their science and make it biologically valid. This is where I started, and this is how I got into this kind of exploration of the way that Mendelism became became uh, such a social theory. Um, and um, um, is this topic relevant today? Um, well, I think I think I believe I believe it is uh, both in the specific sense of genetics and what it can or should do uh, in society and how we should look at it. Maybe you don't need to see the book cover anymore, right? I can just do stop showing screen. Um, and um, um, and also in the term of the way that we, we as citizens of the 21st century look at, at science. Uh, I think uh, I'm a great believer in science. Uh, and I think science is, a, is an amazing, uh, amazing project of of the human spirit and of human technology and of human societies. Uh, and I also think that we need to be uh, all the time critical in our look at, at what scientists do and how they do it and, and what are the implications of what they do because science is such a forceful power um, in, in our society. So I hope that uh, answers uh, your question. I see another question by Matthew. Um, uh, Matthew writes, I work on the influence of race science in China, East Asia, and I'm wondering whether you came across any global, large-scale scientific networks where race scientists work together, exchange information, or formed communities. Um, well, I'm less an expert on on Asia in general, um, but the the general answer is is that there are of course many works on the the interlinks between um, race race scientists in in many in many lands, and I think you can find the literature on that. Yeah. Um, uh, when it comes to Mendelism specifically, uh, I talk now about Germany, but in the book I also devote some space to talking about. Um, other nations and other places, um, especially in the US and in Britain, where the same kind of theories were impl implemented by, but differently, because what, what the, the Brits were preoccupied with was different from what the Americans were and from what the Germans were. So there are different implications and different uses of, of similar theories. And uh, again, there are lots of um, conventions and journals that make sure that information and ideas are shared between scientists in different nations. So there are many, many uh, kinds of, uh, of um, communities and information that goes around. 
And this is also true for race, race science, uh, but I cannot go deeply into that right now, but, but there, there is a lot of literature about that. Um, Atta, if I read it correctly, says or asks, have you come across an example of social and racial adaptations of mental theory uh, in other European contexts, for instance, in the UK during the interwar period? Yes, so um, uh, yes, um, in Britain, as always, the, the issue is class and not uh, class more than race. And there you can find all these discussions, for example, about recessive inheritance implemented to talk about the problem of paupers and you know the, the, uh, the lower classes and the fact that we should not give them um, uh, we should not give them any kind of aid because uh, according to by the way another descendant of, of Darwin, Leonard Darwin, uh, because they have all these recessive traits uh, for uh, feeble-mindedness or for um, pauperism or for um, not being good at what they do, which makes sure that uh, it doesn't help if we help them, these traits would reappear in the next generation. So there is no use of, of helping the current generation. So, um, uh, so yes, there are, there are different applications for this uh, theory depending on, on the, the nation and its uh, uh, and what it is, what it thinks it is uh, mostly troubled by.